Now we'll have the Bible reading in a moment, but a quick explanation uh, first. Um, it's been a bit of a change up in the sermon. Many of you will know that we are doing our hot potatoes, uh, flaming potatoes I call them, hot topics, and we've uh, considered several already and we'll continue to do so over the next few weeks. That's our current teaching series. Um, but today is not the scheduled uh, topic. Didn't feel like I was able to give it um, everything that it deserved this week, and so we'll uh, defer it and come back to it. But another thought occurred to me as um, I was thinking about these things, and uh, it was this, uh, to ask the question, you know, why the Bible? Um, in the topics that we've considered so far, some very difficult ethical issues. Um, essentially, if you've been paying attention, we attempt to come back and try to discern what the Christian Bible says. And um, if it seems to have answers on these things, then for us, we take that to be authoritative and definitive on, uh, on the issue and we seek to then align ourselves and our lives and the difficult decisions that we must make um, with it but um, any thinking person is naturally going to ask why do that um, why this ancient book holding such sway over the hearts and minds of modern people especially when we consider these sort of difficult ethical issues and topics that people debate at length in our world. So I thought it might be useful um, to speak about the authority of the Bible for Christians, the nature of the Bible, and why it is we turn to it to find answers to these questions. So that's what we'll think about in the sermon a little later. And therefore, these two short Bible readings that are about the Bible – this is what the Bible says about itself, and Greg's going to bring us uh, the reading. And the first one is 2 Timothy 3, and then a short verse from 2 Peter 1. Yes, we've got two readings. The first one is Paul talking to his protege, um, Timothy. And then we're going to move to Peter, who was... Um, writing to a lot of churches in uh, ancient Asia Minor, which we probably now call modern-day Turkey. So let's start in 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. But as for you, Paul, Paul to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then we'll move over to second. Peter, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We come now to uh, the sermon, and uh, it is on the authority of the Bible. I'll say a word of prayer, and uh, then I'll share my thoughts on this issue from those verses. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you that uh, we believe, we know, you speak to us. The living God addresses us as individual people and this world, the human heart in its deepest places with a message of truth and grace. It's our deep desire and our longing that the world might know that message and the trustworthiness of the, uh, the instrument you've placed into the world, the Holy Scriptures and their power. We pray that we might taste something of that again for those of us who have... Uh, lived long with your Bible and loved it and that uh, those who have been uncertain about the Bible might be given reasons to think again 
on what it says about itself and consider its claims. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the authority of the Bible. (laughs) The authority of the Bible is very obviously central to Christian faith. Christianity believes things about the man Jesus Christ. These things are found in the New Testament. Uh, No New Testament, no Christianity. Also, everywhere that the Old Testament is mentioned in the New Testament, it is assumed to be faultlessly and unquestionably accurate. In other words, no Old Testament equals no New Testament. So our faith rises and falls on knowing exactly what Scripture says about itself and how its authority is meant to work out in our lives and in our church. That's sort of what we've been doing as we've thought about these difficult, hot topics over the last few weeks. Um, We use the Bible to ask, what is God saying to us? But let's just consider the implication of these two verses, well known to Christians and much used by us. We read them earlier. Uh, Greg read them for us. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Look carefully. He says to Timothy, You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Peter says something similar in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human... (coughs) spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Notice a few things from these verses. These are really obvious points. This is foundational for us. Peter says the authority of Scripture is something we must understand above all. He says above all. Without this truth, as far as he's concerned, The Christian has nothing. And the scriptures are God speaking. This is why it's so foundational. Paul says scripture is God breathed. And Peter says the writers were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now Paul's phrase literally means exhaled. (sighs) Breathed out. He breathed it out. He means he breathed it out the way we breathe out when we speak. I think it's impossible, I'm not, I didn't check this up biologically, but I think it's impossible to speak without breathing out in some form or another. You, you must exhale to get words out. So the speaking person is breathing out. And Paul says the scriptures are the breathing out of God as he speaks words that human beings can understand. And Peter's phrase is taken from descriptions of how wind fills the sails of sailing boats. So it's the same kind of idea. Fills the sails and moves the boat along, which is an appropriate image given that Peter was a fisherman, as you might remember. In other words, the writers of the Bible, they're claiming, were driven by the very spirit and the breath of God. They were under his influence, so to speak. And as a result, the scriptures have certain qualities that they must have if this was true. They must be as reliable as God is. For while they're clearly human documents as well, written down by people, they are also at the same time and miraculously divine documents. That's a similar paradox or thing that's difficult to understand that we face in stating that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. So the Bible is of human beings and yet fully of God. And so the Bible must be without lies because God does not lie. Quite a claim. And points one to three go for all the scriptures. Paul says all scripture 
is this. And Peter says, no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. The application of this for Christians is that we cannot dice the scriptures up into the parts that we like or prefer and the parts that we don't and then ignore those parts. It's all of God. The scriptures are sufficient for all spiritual needs. They need no supplement. The scriptures are all we need to be thoroughly equipped for godliness, to live God's way in this world. So we have in this painfully brief look at just these two verses in the Bible, got a broad brush picture of the Bible's sense of itself as a unique, complete, utterly reliable and authoritative word from God, which is how Christians have taken it to be now for thousands of years. Let me also make a few random points that can help us build a picture of the Bible's view of itself. We notice that the Bible assumes we cannot know God unless he chooses to speak to us. He is a person and unless he reveals himself, we are ignorant of him. We require him to speak. And so the Bible is necessary. Fascinatingly, everywhere a Bible book refers to another part of the Bible, it always assumes it is spoken by God and that it is 100% accurate. The Bible always um, trusts itself, though the books were written over thousands of years by dozens of different authors and it always cites itself as being spoken by God. God's people are never told to heed the words of some other document and no part of the Bible says that another part is wrong. It was certainly Jesus' view that the entire Old Testament was God's word that must not be nullified. Mark chapter 7, verse 13, he said it would not disappear from the earth and that the Bible spoke about him. Jesus' words are called the scripture by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. The words of Jesus are the authoritative words of God. Paul's letters are called the scripture by Peter in uh, chapter 3, verse 15, and that his own eyewitness knowledge is true, which is also what John the Apostle says of all of his writings, and so on and so on and so on. So the scriptures are important because God does not simply reveal himself in mighty deeds that you might observe in this world, though he does that. He uses words to explain those deeds. He's not only done the things recorded in the Bible, he's explained the meaning of what he's done and why he did it. And we must remember as Christians that he's not done that with other events in the world. Okay? He has not given such explanations for other events in world history. So we're often left to wonder what the significance and the full meaning of something. What was God saying through that great historical event? What meaning might it have for us? What are we supposed to conclude? We're not sure the historians write about it and they discuss these things, but there's no definitive explanation from God as to the meaning of that and what the implication of that is for you or for me. And so we remember that even the events described in the Bible don't explain themselves. Even Jesus' death needs God's explanation for us to know what it means for us. Otherwise, we might conclude it's just the meaningless death of a Galilean carpenter in the Roman Empire, and it really has no wider meaning for you or for me. You'd be within your rights to make that conclusion. But the Bible explains what it means. That's how we know what it means. And the explanation is found in this one place. We believe it's greatly freeing to discover that God has a clear and trustworthy word for us. We don't have to search vainly, frantically for this word to us 
as if he just gave us a rough map with an ambiguous X marking some sort of spot. We've got to go out into the world looking for it, waiting for it. We don't have to throw up our hands and say, I wonder what he has to say. We don't need to live with the fear that we don't have all we need to know. Paul said the scriptures give us all we need for life and godliness. There is no lack. They do not contain all the knowledge of the whole world, but all that you need to know, to know God. As a way of capturing the unique authority of the Bible for Christians, the theologians talk about sola scriptura, uh, just a fancy Latin phrase, and it just means The Bible alone, Scripture alone, it stands unique and alone for us. They mean the only thing that's truly authoritative for a Christian, the only thing you're always morally obliged to believe and obey, the only thing in this world we are truly compelled to heed always is the Scriptures. There are three competing authorities that some of the theologians talk about for human life and they vie for this position of authority over our decision making and our understanding. They are reason, what we think with our head, tradition, what we may have heard from some other source and our own experience, the things that have happened to us. But the Christian says only scripture is authoritative, not reason, not tradition, not experience. Now what do I mean by this? Well, reason, as far as its impact on Christianity goes, and if you were to take reason as your authority to direct how Christians should think and make decisions, could be best expressed in what's called liberal Christianity. Here are the four competing authorities, Bible or experience or tradition or reason. Which one will you choose or perhaps where will you put the major emphasis? And what the historians have called liberal Christianity has tended to put the emphasis on reason. It places our own understanding and scientific and historical research on an equal footing with what the Bible seems to say, indeed on a higher footing. If something in current human knowledge or human opinion seems to contradict the Bible, then they suggest we might need to admit that the scriptures are mistaken and bring it into line with our reason. An archaeologist digs up a site and says, oh, I believe now that the Bible was wrong about this particular location of this town, so we must accept their expertise A philosopher says it's simply illogical to believe in the Trinity, so we need to drop that as an embarrassing idea, and so on and so on. Our reason stands over it and looms large in how we make our final decisions. An example of tradition looming large over the other options might be the Catholic, uh, the Roman Catholic idea that the teachings and proclamations of the church should be equally weighted with the scripture, the ancient teaching and magisterium of the church itself. In other words, that a Christian is as obliged to obey the papal proclamations and the Vatican statements as they are obliged to obey the Bible. If you wonder whether or not the statement is in line with the Bible, you are assured that it is really only the church hierarchy that can properly interpret the Bible. So one's own religious tradition begins to loom large. Or you might choose to emphasize your own personal experience of things. This is what's often called mysticism or experientialism. I know the Bible says I must repent in order to be saved, but you know I had a vision last night. And an angel told me that everything's going to work out in the end, no matter what people believe. It was a very vivid experience. Hey, I know what I've experienced and I can't deny it, so don't try to jam Bible verses down my throat and my experience. 
decides what's right for me. Now, of course, tradition and reason and experience are all good things. We use them every day. They're often helpful. They're often good. These things inform our opinion, but they cannot compel the Christian's opinion. That's the simple point. They may be helpful, but they are not authoritative because they are only human. And each of them often makes mistakes. My own experience, human thinking, or the traditions of hmm, some church or denomination or whatever. This is why we have our knowledge of God and we critique our own traditions and our own thinking and even our own experience from the Bible alone. This last picture seeks to try to explain in a confusing way that I've drawn it, I suppose, the relationship of these things to each other as far as biblical Christianity is concerned. Now these options don't exist in a pure form in one person or, or in one church. Mostly we're a mixture of these influences because we're always allowing these things to become competitors with the Bible and placing God's word below them. But unlike all other forms of Christianity and other forms of any other religion, I suppose, the stated aim of biblical evangelical Christianity and the stated aim of our church, by the way, is to try to resist that and to acknowledge only one authority and submit all our reason and all our tradition and all our experiences to it. As imperfectly as we do that, we are on the record as saying that ought to be our attitude. You know, our tradition is to do this, but what does the Bible say? I know that I feel this, but what does the Bible say? People seem to say something is very reasonable, but what does the Bible say? Instead of saying, you know, I know the Bible says this, but we've always done it this way. I know the Bible is saying this, but I feel that. I know the Bible says this, but logic dictates or the scholars demand or reason says, no. Scripture decides. And so in our little picture up here, you've got the Bible standing alone now, separated from the other things that inform our life and our opinions. And a categorical gulf represented by this red line separates them they are different to the bible for us which is god's word and it much more thickly <laughs> determines what true reason and experience and tradition should be there's a relationship between them. the dotted line represents the fact that we are all informed in some way our understanding of the bible can be informed by the tradition the experience or the reason but it truly is authoritative over these things and is different for us as the one true authority and the thing we are compelled to believe. The red line means a gulf exists between the Bible and the other three authorities in our lives. The dotted lines show that these things advise our interpretation, they inform our opinions, but they don't compel our opinions. And the thick arrows show this is actually the Bible that determines right reason, right experience, and right tradition. It judges them authoritatively. Now I know that there are so many questions a thinking person is going to say, have about that, that I don't have time to address, but we'll mention a couple. You know, what about the apparent contradictions in the Bible that I've read about? A lot of people think they've found them. How does the reliability of the Bible stand up to that? What about historical inaccuracies that I've heard are in the Bible? What if I find the miraculous claims of the Bible to be simply impossible? How are we to live under the Bible when it doesn't address every single topic in life? It doesn't say exactly how a scientist should work or what kind of politics I ought to have. What does it mean to submit to God's word in that situation? 
What's the relationship between the original Bible as it was written down and our translations? I know that my Bible is an English translation of an ancient document. What's the relationship between those two things? And aren't the Bible books only in the Bible because some church council said they were okay? Who gave them the right to determine? What about the other Gospels that I read about somewhere? And didn't that movie, The Da Vinci Code, disprove the Bible back in the 90s or whenever it was or something? There are many, many more questions that one might ask. Let me recommend just two books. I know you'll probably never read them because who has time? But for those who might want to work through these questions, they are very helpful. This one is an academic book for the Keen Beans, Scripture and Truth edited by uh, Don Carson and John Woodbridge, uh, Canadian and American uh, Bible scholars, and has a series of essays dealing with the authority of the Bible and why Christians believe it, and attempts to answer many of those other questions. You can borrow that from me, Scripture and Truth. And if you're up for something a little less heavy and much more understandable and actually quite entertaining, uh, everything you want to know about the Bible... Well, maybe not everything, but enough to get you started. By Peter Downey and Ben Shaw, a couple of Aussie guys who wrote a great, um, easily accessible um, book about pretty much everything you might want to ask about the Bible. Those are two very good places to start if you had those questions and you wanted to do some more work in it. Uh, the red one is in our resource room in our uh, church borrowing library and the blue one you can just borrow from me if you're keen. Wow, what a disappointing sermon. It was a pretty boring introduction. It was a bit of a rushed exposition of the Bible verses, a bunch of points that seemed to be jammed together, some weird diagrams that I didn't quite understand and a lot of questions Matthew didn't even bother to answer and a couple of book recommendations that I am never going to read. But what great truths. God must and does speak. He speaks clearly into our world through his scriptures, which are unique, reliable, always truthful. And how we honour that scripture will profoundly affect the kind of Christianity we live. Hebrews chapter 4 also says something about the Bible. It says, The word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. And it penetrates the soul and the spirit. And it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the human heart like nothing else. This book speaks to us. It understands us. It is God's voice to us. That's why the first thing we want to know on any difficult topic is, what does the Bible say? There was once a young Frenchman named Emile Calais. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. We'll call him Emile. And I love this story, and it's a true story, apparently. He was a real fella. The education he received in a small French village about 100 years ago was totally opposed to Christianity, even all that time ago. In fact, he never even saw a Bible, he said, until he was 23 years old. And he himself was vehemently anti-Christian. He fought in World War I. And he saw his friends killed before his own eyes. He said the pain of life without meaning was overwhelming. And after he was wounded, he spent nine months in hospital. And he married a Scots-Irish woman he'd met before the war. But he made it clear that religion was to play no part in their life together as a couple or as a family. He pursued an academic career. He was a brilliant young man, Emile. But he was reading the things that he read as an aspiring professor with a new purpose. He consumed literature and philosophy. As strange as it may sound, he said, I was looking for a book that would understand me, not just one that I could understand. I knew of no such book, so I began preparing one of my own. Every time I read a passage that moved me, I copied it into a pocketbook and I carried it around with me. He says, one day he put the finishing touches on the book that would understand me, that would speak to his condition and guide his life. He sat under a tree on a sunny day and he opened it up, all his notes. 
As he read, he says, his disappointment grew. For many passages that he'd gathered over the years seemed stale. They only reminded him of what he was back then. They seemed to not speak. They were mute. He was devastated. The whole project seemed like a failure. And at that very moment, he claims, his wife arrived. An extraordinary thing happened. She knew nothing of this book or really of the, the despair that he was feeling. And she pushed the baby carriage into the garden uh, with their child and she told a strange story. She said, listen, she'd walked to the boulevard, but it was too crowded and hot, so she went into a side street she didn't know. Uh, they were new to this town. The cobblestone shook the baby carriage. She wasn't sure what to do. She saw some grass through an old stone archway and she went into it and the grass led to a staircase. She took the baby and she climbed up, not really knowing why. At the top was a long room with a door open. She entered. At the far end of the room, she said, sat a white-haired gentleman at a desk. She saw a great carving of a cross and she realised that she'd probably stumbled into the offices at the back of an old church, a Huguenot um, Protestant church which was designed from the days of persecution uh, in the Reformation times when the Protestants had to hide and they would build and design churches in the nooks and crannies of the city that wouldn't be noticed by the other buildings and she'd stumbled upon it. And the old man sitting at the desk was the pastor. She walked to the desk and she said, I asked him, have you a Bible in French? He gave one to her straight away and she left. And she said to Emile, I'm sorry, I don't know why this has happened. I know you don't want us to, and then he cut her off. A Bible, you say? Give me the Bible. I've never even seen one. He says, I rushed to my study with it, and I opened by chance at the Beatitudes of Jesus. I read and read, and now I read aloud with indescribable warmth surging in me. It dawned on me. This is the book that would understand me. He read into the night, reading gospel after gospel. The one who spoke and acted in them came alive to me, he said. It seemed absurd to speak of a book understanding a man. But this could be said of the Bible, because its pages were animated by the presence of the living God and the power of his mighty acts. To this God, he said, I prayed that night. And the God who answered was the same God of whom it was spoken in the book. Emile Callier went on to become professor of Christian philosophy, Princeton University. A person can be changed forever by the word of God. I pray you are. Let me pray. Almighty God, we're frail and sinful, such limited creatures, so hard for us to know what is the right thing to do. Who are we? And who are you? What do you want of us? Can we know you? Can guilt be done away with? Can we receive the promise of fellowship with God, eternal life, and the truly deepest needs of human life? Well, we believe that you answer us and that your word is powerful and that it is enough. And we pray that we would take the authority of the Bible and seek to live it out, that we would treasure it, not just have an academic idea in our head about its authority as a concept, but that it would be that for us. For ultimately your word is a love letter to us from you seeking us in our heart pleading with us to turn to the heavenly father who loves us 
Let us see these things and continue to think about the difficult things of this life together in truth and grace, in truth and love, but always with an understanding that you have made your will known to us and we want to know it in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.